Welcome to Vintage Radio Classics as we dabble into the Western series of Frontier Gentlemen. This was a radio series that didn't even last a whole year, starring John Daney, and was very well produced and heard on CBS from February 2nd to November 16th of 1958. Initially heard Sunday afternoons at 2.30 p.m. through March, when it moved to 7 p.m. afterwards. The program opened with a triumphant theme by Jerry Goldsmith and this introduction. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual accounts. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. The music for the series was by Wilbur Hatch and Jerry Goldsmith, very famous for a lot of, what can we say, popular radio shows of the time. They also supplied the opening triumphant theme. The announcers were Dan Guberly, Johnny Jacobs, Bud Sewell, and John Wald. Supporting cast for the show throughout the year that it was on was Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dopkin, Virginia Gregg, which also starred in Gunsmoke. Virginia Gregg was Kitty on the whole series of Gunsmoke throughout the years it was on the radio. Stacy Harris, Johnny Jacobs, Joseph Kearns, which is a very popular person. Anybody that knows Dennis the Menace, Joseph Kearns was the neighbor. Jack Kirshen, Jack Moyles, Jeanette Nolan, Vic Perrin, if anybody has ever seen The Wild Wild West, for instance, on television, Jack Perrin was a yes on that show. And Barney Phillips. So this show was full of liveliness. It was a well-produced show. It was a show that brought out what can we say, professionalism and an accuracism of a person that was traveling the Wild West in the days of the Wild West. And it was an awesome show to listen to. We will listen to one episode today that is by the Frontier Gentleman. And this one will be called, Yes, Let Me Find It, uh, was recorded on... Let's see, that would be January, February, March 2nd, 1958, episode 5, The Lost Mine, which will star Joseph Kearns as the old miner that takes the frontier gentleman on his journey through being a greenhorn. Um, what is a greenhorn? A greenhorn is uh, somebody that really doesn't know what's going on, and They take it to the mine to find that there is no mine, and I don't want to give the story up, but yes, here we go, episode five, The Lost Mine with Joseph Kern, which was Dennis the Menace, neighbor next door, Uh, what was his name, Mr. Wilson, yes, he was Mr. Wilson, um, at the time, Dennis the Madness. <laughs> We're rambling now. Let's get on with vintage classic radios as we listen to Frontier Gentlemen, Episode 5, The Lost Mine, 24 minutes, 38 seconds. Wonderful show, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you for listening, and here we go. There's a fever in the mining country of Montana Territory. It's known as gold colic. Once a man catches it, it can only mean one thing. Life or death. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. 
As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. His account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. Fort Benton under Missouri in Montana Territory is what you might call a clearing house for supplies. They are shipped by riverboat up the Missouri, food, clothing, guns, ammunition, whiskey, tobacco, and from Fort Benton on to the west and north by pack train and wagon. The post is also the point of debarkation for the tenderfoot, the inexperienced miner seeking the fabulous gold fields of the territories. It seemed a worthwhile spot to find a story for the London Times, and so on my arrival... I went to the office of the local newspaper, the Fort Benton Dispatch. The editor was an affable chap by the name of John Warren. He took me into his tiny office. London Times, eh? Sit down, Mr. Kendall. Thank you. Well, this must seem kind of like a tin horn paper to you. Oh, not at all, Mr. Warren. As a matter of fact, uh, I rather envy you. My work depends entirely upon whether the editor likes my story or not. If he doesn't, I don't get paid. If he does, well, I'm, I'm in luck. Mm-hmm. Well, let's hope I can put you onto something good. That's very kind of you. Of course, the best thing you could do is to talk to some of the old-timers around. They've got a hundred stories. Well, first I wondered, has there been much gold found in this vicinity? Around Benton? No, most of it's north and southwest of here. Big strikes over to Virginia City and Bannock. Mind you, there's talk. Oh, you, you hear it around once in a while, of gold in these parts. But I never heard of anyone striking it rich. Most of the boys just pick up supplies here and try to get a grub stake to head on out to the mountains. I see. Well, didn't you ever try prospecting? Nope. Found a good wife, a pleasant way to live. I make out and I'm happy. Too many hill rats wasting their... The hill rats? Prospectors. Too many of them wasting their lives for that one big chance. I guess I'm not that much of a gambler. <laughs> Where would I be likely to find a chap like that, uh, um, a hill rat? Oh, Benton's full of them. You want a real old-timer... Go down and see Shorthorn Tom. <laughs> Shorthorn Tom? Yeah. Nobody knows his real name, and he's probably forgotten it himself. You'll find him down at the shack's end of the street here. Turn left. Yeah, his place is the first one on the left. Good. I'll call on him. And look, uh, don't let him talk you into grub staking him. He's got a lot of crazy ideas about finding a lost mine. He's been at it for six years, they say. Well, I'll be careful. Say, uh, Mr. Kendall... Why don't you join me and the missus for dinner tonight? You'd sure be welcome. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Warren. Well, it's not every day we get to meet a traveled man like yourself. <laughs> uh, I'll see you later, Mr. Kendall. It wasn't hard to find Shorthorn Tom's place. I could have discovered it on a foggy London night by the smell alone. A ramshackle lean-to affair it had the odor best described as rotting fermented cabbage, which a moment later I found emanated from the gentleman himself. The old prospector was the most unwashed individual I've ever come across in my life. Bleary-eyed, he greeted me at the sacking that passed for a door. Um, um, Shorthorn Tom? I wonder if I could have a few words with you? What's the matter, boy? You got the heaves? No, I... I don't believe so. <laughs> Sound like it. <laughs> you want words? Come on in. <clears throat> got me a mess of poop stewing. <clears throat> right and rest your saddle, mister. Ah. What's your business? Well, I'm writing about the territory for a newspaper, Tom. I thought possibly you might be able to give me some information. Ah, information? What kind of information? Oh, the... Life of a miner, for example, your life. <laughs> no, no, I'm quite serious. You want to pay for information? Oh, well, I hadn't exactly planned on it. Then I ain't got no medicine for you. <clears throat> Five dollars? Yeah, I would see it. Oh, ain't you got no real money? Never did trust a bit of paper. I'm afraid that's it. Well, better than a sack of dingbats, I guess. <clears throat> 
You uh, want some pooch? Is that what you're cooking? Yeah, tomato, sugar, and bread. Lost my teeth a couple of weeks back. Can't eat nothing but. I, I don't think so. Thanks very much. Well, <coughs> well, you go ahead and ask what you want. I'll eat. I understand you've been mining in this country for some time. Oh, 20 here, more other places. Got the biggest strike a man ever sees six years back. Eh, but I lost it. Really? Well, I'd like to hear about that. No more than 20 miles from here, too. Except nobody believes it. But I heard there wasn't any gold to speak of here. You heard, you heard, you uh, Listen, mister. Oh, them that tell you that don't know they're saddled from a prairie dog hole. <laughs> I'm not telling you. There's diggings over in them mountains. The high woods. I seen them. I know what's there. Gold. Five thousand a ton if it's worth a cent. What happened to it? Well, <clears throat> me and a partner was prospecting in the high woods. Got lost and caught in a blizzard. Sam. Sam, he was my partner. And he went west. Wind blew him clean off the trail, about a thousand feet down. Well, <clears throat> I found the cave, see. I figured to stay put till the weather broke. And that's where I found it. Uh, in the cave? Right in the cave. Indian or Spanish diggings, I figure. Nuggets as big as your saddle. Well, go on. Well, that's all. I brought the nuggets back. <laughs> Had me some fun. Then went back to work the mine. And I couldn't find it. It's unbelievable. Sure, that's what they all say. Shorthorn Tom, biggest liar in Montana territory. Ain't nobody going to give old Tom a grub steak to make them all look sick as a mule. But they must have known about the nuggets you found. Mister, a fellow who's in it rich is like to give away more than I took out of that cave. Oh, that's how they figure I got the gold. Or it was given to me. It's quite a story. Yes, <laughs> ain't it? Now I'm between a rock and a hard place. Doing a job here and around to scrape up a dollar for grub. Well, up there, there's enough gold to buy me the whole dang town. When did you give up looking for it? When? <laughs> Mister, when you got gold colic like I got it, you just never give up. You sure you want to have some of this pooch? Mighty tasty. Uh, no, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Eight times I've been back looking till I run out of grub. But one of these days... Hey... You wouldn't be interested in uh, in going partners, would you? Oh, um, I don't think so. It's very kind of you to offer. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let me show you something. Uh, <coughs> you uh, you know what gold looks like? I've seen it. Yeah. Good Lord. That must be worth... 200, 250. Well, but... Couldn't you use this to buy what you need for another try? Could, but won't. If I spent this and didn't find the mine, <laughs> there'd be nothing left to prove what I know. Hmm. Well, it wouldn't cost more than a hundred dollars. Man could take one mule for packing. Pretty good outfit. Oh, I ain't saying the best, but it'd do. Only on twenty miles from here. Well, how about fifty dollars? No, 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 a hundred. And you know what? I got a feeling. If a man wanted to put up a hundred dollars, this could be the lucky time. Oh, I've been feeling it for a week. The weather's good. This trip out, I'd find it. Well, Tom, uh, I have an idea for nothing else but the experience that'd be worth it. <laughs> All right. Here. Fifty. Seventy. And ninety. One hundred. If you don't find it, I'll be in your shoes. Flat. Busted. Oh, mister. Hey, hey what's your name? Kendall. Well, Kendall, you got yourself a partner. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll take this here money and get us fixed up. We can leave right away. Bed out tonight. Oh, uh, where are you staying? No, I've got a room at the American Hotel. Meet you there in two hours. Oh, uh, Tom, mm, there's nothing personal, you understand, but I think a little security is indicated uh, in case of accidents. Oh, you figuring me to deal from the bottom? All right, I'll tell you what. Now, I'll give you the nugget, see? You trust me with your hundred, I trust you with my nugget. And if I don't show up in two hours ready to travel, you made yourself a profit. Fair enough. <laughs> Mister, you may not know it, but you're going to be one of the richest men in Montana. <laughs> or the poorest. I'll meet you at the hotel.
In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. When you hear CBS News, you're hearing the results of worldwide watchfulness that pays off in accurate reporting sped to your sets with minimum delay. CBS News has reporters in every corner of the world. By keeping your set tuned to CBS Radio, you not only get your favorite entertainment, but the regular news programs of the nation's best reporters, plus special bulletins whenever they are called for by CBS News. Make the Star's Address your listening post on the nation's most listened to programs and for the nation's most listened to news reports as well. And now we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of Frontier Gentlemen. I had left Shorthorn Tom at a general store to buy supplies. Precisely two hours later, the old prospector was outside my hotel, leading a scrawny-looking burrow, which looked as though it would momentarily collapse under the weight of its pack. It seemed that we were ready, except for one thing. Shorthorn Tom was blind, roaring, drunk. Here you are, fighter! <laughs> I'm all set and ready to go! <laughs> I had me a little scamper juice to kind of start things off right. <laughs> um, here, here's your nugget, Tom. Oh, you're an honest man, Kendall. Come on, let's get going. Well, if it ain't my old pal, Shorthorn Tom. Who? Oh, Kendall. You see this suck egg dog? Calls himself Willie Sanders. Worst no good son of a gun claim jumper. This or any other side of the Rockies. So you got yourself a grub steak, Tom. This uh, fellow you're playing for sucker? Sucker? Do you see this nugget, you river sniper? We're going to get more like it. You've been laughing at me and my gold in the Highwood Mountains, huh? Well, we'll see who's the sucker. No good varmint. I got a good mind. Uh, uh, Tom! Tom. Ain't no good trying to rouse him, mister. He does it every time. You bet he poured a whole bottle of whiskey in him. Get stiffer than a board. He'll be like that for hours. Give me a hand with him, will you? I'll take him up to my room. They won't let that old buzzard in the hotel. I think they will. Come on. I had the boy take the burrow to the stable. Then together, Saunders and I carried old Tom into the hotel, up to my room, and put him down on the bed. He was snoring quite peacefully. My companion, Saunders, was not of the nicest type. Thick black brows growing in an almost straight line across his eyes, and a cast in one eye which gave him an even more villainous appearance. As I put Tom's nugget in my pocket, I saw him give it a sidelong glance. You uh, believe that story of his? I have no doubt of it at all. Nobody else in Benton does. Well, that may well be their misfortune. Uh, did he tell you where the mine is? He gave me a rough idea. Now, thanks very much for your help. Uh, you uh, grub-staked him, huh? I grub-staked him. Good afternoon, Mr. Sanders. You uh, really think there's a mine? My dear fellow, I can't see what earthly concern it is of yours, but yes, I think there is a mine. Uh, how about taking a couple more partners on, uh, me and a pal of mine? Not interested, thank you. Uh, he find that nugget up there? You heard him. Goodbye, Mr. Saunders. Tom. Tom. <sighs> Two hours later, he was still asleep. I locked him in the room and went downstairs for dinner. The bill came to six dollars, leaving me with exactly two in my pocket and a growing doubt as to the wisdom of my investment. I was just about to get up to leave the table when I heard a voice behind me. Hi there, handsome. Yes, you. Uh, good evening. Mind if I join you? Why, no, not at all. Won't you sit down? I've been watching you from over there. You know what I said to myself? I said, there's a real lonesome man. A real lonesome man. So I come over to make you feel better. Oh, 
Well, as a matter of fact, I'm in quite high spirits, really. That's swell. That's real swell. I'm glad. My, you've got a beautiful way of talking. Thank you. You're good-looking, too. Nice and tall and good-looking. Very kind of you. You know what I bet? Oh, I haven't the remotest idea. I bet you're from the East and you're going to look for gold. And I bet you find it. What do you think of that? Extraordinary. I'm Alice. What's your name? J.B. Kendall. J.B.? What does that mean? Oh, just initials, you know, J.B. Everybody calls me J.B. I like that. It's strong. J.B. Would you like to go someplace quieter to talk, J.B.? Not particularly. You see, I have a friend upstairs in my room. Oh? No. You don't understand. A gentleman. Not feeling too well. I am sorry. Then if you like, we could go to my place. Charming thought, but not tonight. You don't like me. Well, to the contrary, I find you irresistible, but I must say I question your motives. Mm-hmm. Run along, dear. Your friend, Mr. Sanders, is much too interested in our conversation. Sanders? Who's he? The gentleman behind the pillar. See? I saw you come in with him before. Uh, would you be good enough to give him a message? Just say, no partners. Good night. <laughs> Shorthorn Tom didn't awaken until the next morning, and I marveled at his recuperative powers. He showed not the slightest effects of the night before. We collected our burrow and left Fort Benton at sunrise and started south toward the Highwood Mountains. Two days later, we were in the heart of the mountains. Tom was in excellent spirits. He seemed to know exactly where he was going. You see that gulch, bro? I swear I got sight of it before that doggone blizzard closed in six years back. Yes, sir, we're on the right trail this time. Do you mind stopping for a moment? Sure. I... I thought I heard something. Oh, man gets that way in the mountains. Here, a lot of things ain't really there. No, no, it it sounded like horses. Oh, just echo the old burrow, that's all. What's your real name, Tom? Oh, I ain't had none except Shorthorn Tom for so long, I near forget sometimes. Eh, when I was a sprout, I, I had me some folks called Weatherly. It was a long time back, Kendall. What about Shorthorn? Where did you find that name? Never found it. It was given to me. That's what they called a tenderfoot down south of ways. And the name stuck. Hey, you got a handle, uh, except Kendall? Uh... J.B. J.B. Um, Jeremy Bryan. Jeremy Bryan. Oh, partner, I'm sorry. Mighty sorry. Man could get killed out here with a name like that. Uh, trail's getting narrower yonder. You better watch your step. It's a long drop down. How much further from here? Oh, not much ways. It don't look like much. Just a hole in the rock, but... When you get inside, she opens up to a sizable cave. Look! Look! There she is! Come on! Well, it, it looks like a cave, all right, but you said the opening was small. Oh, it's the one, I tell you. You see inside. Come on, now. I'll watch your step. I will. Watch it. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. No, I can't exactly recollect whether it was... On this side or the other? Can you see any sign of diggings? No. Oh, might have been a fall covered it up. Say, I'll use my pick here. You try where you are. We stayed there, working, digging at the solid walls of that cave for over three hours. Tom must have known it was hopeless, but he wouldn't give up. Only shouted words of encouragement to me and dug into seams the harder with his pick. Then quite suddenly he stopped. I turned and saw him lying on the other side of the cave. Uh, uh, Tom. uh, Tom? Oh, pain. And my stuffings. Up to my chest. Ain't easy to breathe. Oh, here. Here. Lie on your back. There we are. Oh, that's better. (coughs) I tell you, J.B., I tell you. Oh, it's a cold trail. I, I, I know that some time back this ain't the place. 
don't feel it. It just don't smell right. I was kidding myself. It, it ain't the place. Oh, no, that doesn't matter. No, I guess not. Not no more. Oh, here. You, you take this. What, what for? I don't want the nugget. I told you. It's worth 250 maybe. I won't need it now. I'm going up Salt River, partner. Do uh, you mean you're going to die nonsense? Boy, one thing a man knows when he's old, buzzard bait like me, he knows when it's time to die. But listen, listen, you, you go on look and see. Them diggings is around here somewhere. Maybe further along the trail. Maybe there's another cave along a bit. No, 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 Tom. Tom, lie back. No, out of my way. Tom. I'm going to find Tom. you just along the trail. Tom! <laughs> That old Tom, he sure had the gold colic bad, didn't he? He dead, Sanders? Sure he's dead. Don't you figure, mister? Yes. Me and my partner here, we come up to see how you was doing. Didn't find the mine, huh? No, we didn't find it. Well, there's still the nugget. I seen him give it to you. Hand it over, huh? Gentlemen, I feel rather sad about Tom's passing. Be good chaps and let well enough alone. You kidding with that talk? Oh, he's a dude. He can't help the way he talks. Hey, you give us a nugget, huh? Now, both of you, get up. Up! Now, each of you take a pick. Start digging. We'll bury him here. You give me any argument, I'll shoot you on the spot. After Shorthorn Tom was buried, I took the horses belonging to Sanders and his friend and started back to Fort Benton. I had the idea the walk would do them good. After sending my story to the Times, I had a drink for old Tom, then packed to leave for Helena in Montana Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Joe Kearns, Don Diamond, Virginia Gregg, and Herb Ellis. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Stay tuned for the Ford Road Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentleman. John Wall speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>